Well, good morning. It's a real privilege to be with you once again at Hamilton Baptist Church. Uh, my name is John McKinnon. I am your moderator uh, over there at the church at the present moment in time as we continue to pray for God's leading and for God's guidance in terms of bringing to us uh, the right person to become the new uh, senior pastor, lead pastor at Hamilton Baptist Church. And uh, it's beautiful uh, to be with you today at the very early part of a new series that you're doing, looking at the, the fruit of the Spirit, looking at what it is uh, to be a fruitful people uh, for God. Now I want to begin just by making two observations. Uh, firstly, uh, if you've tuned in uh, expecting a good friend and uh, fellow preacher Scott Hamilton, uh, Scott was unable to be with us this morning and so at pretty short note I've stepped in uh, just to uh, bring you uh, the, the continuing sermon in the series that you're looking at at the present moment in time. Of course the language of the substitute is language that we are well familiar with as the people of God uh, as we think about the incredible substitutionary death uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place and we're not long after our Easter celebrations when we were recalling and recounting and rightly celebrating the grace of God towards us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the second thing is to say that I'm, I'm just delivering this message from home. Uh, normally uh, when I would preach for Hamilton Baptist Church I would uh, have one or two of the folks at my home church in Caldwell Baptist uh, record that for me and able to preach uh, from the lectern there. Uh, but as this is the, the second week of the school holidays and a lot of folks are on holiday, uh, then uh, I was unable uh, to make that happen. However, let's uh, pray together and then after we pray we're going to read God's word and then we're going to begin to unpack our theme for today. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we do thank you for your amazing grace towards us in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for all that he has accomplished on Calvary's cross and for all that he has applied to each one of our lives. And we pray that as we gather together this day are people who would want to praise and adore you, who would want our worship of you to be the overflow of hearts that are amazed at the wonder, at the fullness, at the height, at the depth, at the length, at the breadth of your love for us. And as we gather, Lord God, in praise and adoration, uh, and then as we uh, seek to listen to your word, that even as your word is read, you would speak into our hearts and lives. And as your word is preached, we ask that you would apply it to us, that we might uh, not only hear it, but we might be those who would do your word, putting it into practice in our lives. So move amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, uh, let's turn uh, our attention to uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to read that well-known passage uh, about love. And there's a reason for that, because it's the first uh, of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit that we're uh, studying over this little series. Now, you'll notice that I've been very careful to say uh, that when Paul uh, wrote about the fruit of the Spirit, he didn't write about fruits. He didn't write about uh, a, a kind of multiple choice scenario. In actual fact, he was writing to say that when you and I <clears throat> are a people who are filled with the Spirit of God, then the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these characteristic uh, fruit uh, would be evident in the hearts and lives of the people of God. And of course, one of the great uh, passages in Scripture, we'll look at a couple of passages this morning uh, that speak of this, uh, is found in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. So let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, we read there. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so now faith, hope and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, this of course is such a familiar passage to us and a great favourite of so many of God's people down through the years. I think sometimes we we keep it as a favourite, probably with aspirations that one day we might actually live out all that that passage describes. I know that none of us would be so foolish as to suggest that in actual fact it's fully descriptive of where we are at the present moment in time. But by the Spirit of God, we're seeking day by day to allow God, by his word and by his spirit, to make and to mould and to shape us ever increasingly into the likeness of Christ, that you and I together as the people of God might demonstrate the love of God to a watching world. And of course, if you and I would want to know anything about love, then we need to understand that that begins and ends with God. Uh, God is the first and the last word about love. Uh, John, the gospel writer, when he was writing uh, about uh, love in his letter 1 John in chapters 3 and in chapter 4, uh, there he simply uses three words and he says, God is love. Now that'll come uh, as no surprise to us. Uh, Jonathan, uh, our beloved brother, last week gave us a wonderful message uh, out of John chapter 15. And in fact, when you look at John 15 and you look at 1 John 3 and you look at 1 John 4 and you look at 1 Corinthians 13, you begin to get this wonderful full picture of uh, the amazing love of God. And it's this amazing love of God that by the Spirit of God has to characterise his people. And I'll say a little bit more about what Jonathan said in just a few minutes. But before we get there, you know, I, I, I love that hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond All Measure. And whenever we begin to think uh, about the fruit of the Spirit being love in our lives, then in actual fact, what we're thinking about here uh, is the ocean of the immeasurable love of God 
being evident in our lives, not just individually, but also corporately as the people of God. You will know uh, that the scripture says, by your love for one another will people know that you are my disciples. Now this, this was actually incredibly important in the context of 1 Corinthians 13. And it's incredibly important in the context of any church, the length and breadth of the land. You know, there are many themes that come out of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. But as you uh, read that letter and in amongst all the discussions about spiritual gifts and everything else, there in the midst of it is Paul speaking into our hearts and talking about the most excellent way of love. Now, why would Paul do that? Well, if truth be told, Paul was very concerned about the church at Corinth because they were a very divided people. And they were a divided people because within the life of the church, there was an arrogance amongst people who thought themselves to be powerful. There was an arrogance amongst people uh, who were refusing to work together for the advancement of the gospel. There was a kind of one-upmanship going on uh, amongst the people in the church there. And of course that wasn't building anyone up in their faith. And it certainly uh, wasn't edifying uh, those who were weak or those who were young in the faith and needing to know what it is uh, to live out all the characteristics of a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I really uh, was ministered to by Jonathan's message uh, last Sunday morning and I trust that you all were there and I love the way in which she was talking about it's the degree to which we abide in Christ that we will bear fruit and the fruit we will bear will be the characteristics that are produced in the life of a follower of Jesus uh, by the Holy Spirit as he applies the word of God and produces that word in our life. And so uh, he, he was displaying for us this wonderful picture of Christian character, examples of, of what it might look like in our lives to be fruit-bearing people. Now we very often quickly run to the idea of being fruit-bearing people in terms of proclaiming the gospel and bearing fruit that will endure for all eternity in terms of leading others to Christ. And that's, that's a great place to go. It's a, a passion of my heart. You know, my whole life is lived out longing for people to come to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. But in actual fact, uh, Jonathan was right. Uh, I would have used the phrase in John 15 of union and communion. When you and I are united to Christ by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we then have this wonderful privilege of communion with Christ in the place of prayer, in feeding upon his word, in growing day by day, ever increasingly into the likeness of Christ. And when we do that, one of the, the, the first things that happens is that we realise that our salvation is a salvation to be fruitful, uh, to bear the fruit of the character of God in our lives, and so to glorify him. And Jonathan was being very careful to empathise for us, uh, to, to empathise with us and to emphasise for us that in actual fact God wants to do this work in us. We long to win others to Christ by love, but we need to grow in holiness. We need to grow in obedience, in love. We need to learn what it is to give in loving and generous ways out of a heart that has been shaped and moulded by the love of Christ. And so again, I, I take you back to my, uh, my little hymn, uh, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast 
beyond all measure. You know, when you and I can somehow or other uh, hold something of the ocean of the immeasurable love of God in our hands, how can we do that? Uh, to hold something of the ocean of the immeasurable love of God in our hands. If you and I could hold something of the ocean of the immeasurable love of God in our head, but if you and I could hold something of the ocean of the immeasurable love of God in our hearts, then what would happen is that the overflow of our heart would be the love of God towards everyone that we come into contact. And first and foremost, it would be amongst the people of God. And amongst the people of God, as we demonstrate this love, then that would be a great witness to the world. Imagine for a moment what it would be like if we didn't allow ourselves the excuses we so often do, that that's just our fallen human nature, but instead we actually applied ourselves with rigour to the Word of God and were open day by day to the Spirit of God and we were allowing God by His Word and Spirit to really plant the heights, the depths, the length, the breadth of the love of God in our hearts and we were showing that to one another. Even the Lord Jesus Christ when, when He was being questioned uh, you know, by the religious leaders uh, and they asked Him what the great commandment is and He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself and they said oh you've answered well and he said following that he told them the parable of course parable of the good Samaritan he said it's fine to say you know that but until that becomes the exercise of your life you know the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God producing in you all that God wants to produce within you, then there's a real sense in which when we come back to the text of 1 Corinthians 13, we might speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but because we're not characterised by love, then we're a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Do you know, think about how grating that is. You know, if I were to take a set of symbols uh, and to sit there banging them off each other as you sit and listen, oh, how that would get into your head uh, and it wouldn't be a blessing and it wouldn't be something that you would long for more of. And he says, you know, you, you might have some of the greatest things to say, but if they're not said, out of a heart that has been shaped and moulded by the love of God and Christ. Oh, it's a gong. It's a symbol. You know, you could have all prophetic powers and all understand all mysteries and all knowledge of faith that moves mountains. But if there's no real love, love for your brothers and sisters, no real love that forgives their iniquities, that sees not the speck in their eyes. No real love for them, if truth be told, sometimes there's hatred. Then in actual fact, you're nothing. You could be the most generous person in the world, and you could deliver up your body to be burned, but if you have not love, you gain nothing. Now, one of the things that we'll discover as we look a little bit more at all of this, is that uh, love is not only an action, it most certainly is an action, but love uh, is also about the motive of our heart and the motives of our life. Uh, and we've got to be motivated in love for the glory of God. Now I want to say to us that the 
the right place uh, for love to flow from is is to flow uh, out of an act of worship. True love flows out of true worship and out of true sacrifice. True love always flows out of true love and out of true sacrifice. And one of the great things, when, when you turn to, if we had stayed with uh, the Apostle John, and that's where we started in this little series in John 15, if we'd have stayed with John and we'd went to 1 John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 4, there we'd have discovered that, that true love always flows out of true worship and out of true sacrifice. Now, I, I want us to really take note of that. Uh, because the reality is that uh, love is always the overflow of a heart that worships God aright. I, I'm a, a, a great student of and a great lover of John's Gospel. And, uh, you know, when I read the, the letters of Paul, I, I love his linear way of thinking. He's very logical and very linear. When I read John's Gospel and when I read the letters of John, John kind of thinks in a sort of a cyclical way. Uh, he, he, he brings out great themes and he goes back to them again and again and again. And of course all the way through John's Gospel you get the, the great themes of love and of life and of light. And of course in the, uh, the letters that John writes it's no surprise that again you get these great themes of love and of light and of life. And when you, when you think about those themes for just a little moment and remember that that leading theme, that theme of love that John brings to us, that Paul in actual fact, writing to the church at Corinth, and as we apply that in our series in the Fruit of the Spirit, says is the absolute foundation of what it is to be a believer and to live for God and to glorify God uh, in our life. When you look at that, you, you realise that there, there must be polar opposites to these things. Now, the polar opposites of love and of light and of life uh, are of course hatred and darkness and death uh, and the opposite of love is hatred and, and John when he writes in 1 John 3 and 4 he, he, he's I mean he's brutal in speaking into the lives of believers I mean he turns around and he says if you don't have love for your brother then you hate him and, and you're not living as one who's in Christ uh, and, and the reality is, you know, he, he does not miss and hit the wall. And when you look at the opposite of light, it's darkness. And when you look at the opposite of life, it is death. But whenever we look at the people of God, the people of God should never be those who are known for hatred, darkness and death, for the kind of divisive, destructive characteristics that these things are. But instead, the people of God are a people characterised by the love of God. And so they are a people who breathe in a dynamic way love and light and life. Now, I'm going to set that in the context of worship just before I, I apply that to uh, a little text here in, in 1 Corinthians 13 and that verses 4 and following. But think about that for a moment. That you and I, as the people of God, because God is love and because he breathes with dynamic power, love and light and life into everything so you and I breathe love and light and life into everything. Of course the, the, the context 
in which John, when he was writing about these things in uh, his letters, he draws out the example of Cain and Abel. I always find that fascinating. That, that Cain and Abel's context was one of worship. We sometimes forget that, don't we? You know, there uh, in the Garden of Eden, a garden created in, in love and incredible intimacy of relationship between God and man, all founded in the love of God. And it's not long before, uh, in the context of worship, we meet with Cain and Abel. And it's not long before uh, we see the jealousy, we see the enmity, we see the hatred prominent and remember it's in a context of worship it's why paul writes to a church at corinth uh, and, and he speaks about gross injustices in the context of worship and he reminds them of this incredible fruit this characteristic of love in the life of a believer and of course in 1 John chapter 3 and at verse 10, he says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So that's holiness. But nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now that's very powerful. And he goes on, of course, to illustrate all of that from the example uh, of Cain and of Abel. And so for you and I, it's so important uh, as we get nearer to that day where we can gather again as the people of God, the worshipping people of God, to not just assume that because we are amongst the worshipping people of God, our hearts are right and our heads are right and our actions are always motivated by love because sometimes we can do things by way of practice, rote, you know, sort of routine. But in actual fact, we, we've not ourselves allowing the love of God to so overwhelm us that we cannot help ourselves but respond to every situation as God and Christ would in love. Love that displays all that he longs for us to do. And so it's one of the reasons why I would say that true love flows out of true worship and out of true sacrifice. Now, I'm sure you, like me, love that beautiful text of Scripture in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, we, we love that text of Scripture. Uh, it, it's life-giving. It's dynamic, uh, and, and, and many of us memorise it from heart, and we love to share it with others, and rightly so. But I wonder how many of us have memorised 1 John 3, 16. For 1 John 3, 16 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. It's a powerful text of scripture. And I want to say that true love always flows out of true worship for God. And true sacrifice as we lay down our life for the benefit, for the blessing. Uh, and that laying down our life can be uh, the laying down uh, of, you know, assumed position or whatever it might be 
for the benefit and blessing uh, of others. It's to live a distinctively different life when we live following the example of the love of God in Christ. Well, true love also uh, must take on board all of our actions and not just our actions but the motives that lie behind them. And so while true love will flow out of true worship and sacrifice, true love will also be measured by the right actions and measured by the right motives for those actions. And so when you and I display the love of God in Christ, there will be a consistency to our actions and there will be a consistency to our motives. The love that we display in Christ will be a costly love and the love that we display in Christ will be a practical love. And it brings us back to that little text or series of texts in 1 Corinthians 13 where in the midst of uh, the church at Corinth where there were many uh, horrific things taking place amongst the people of God. Uh, Paul writing to the church and writing because Paul's linear thinking's all there. Uh, so what he says to the church at Galatia is applicable to the church at Corinth is as applicable to our church today. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. My friends, if you and I in our lives are characterised characterized by the eternal life which is ours in Christ, all by the amazing grace of God, then logic would lead us to the conclusion that love is something which is going to be in us ever increasingly day by day and for all eternity. It is an unending characteristic of the people of God. Many of you, of course, will, will know uh, that aged example uh, that many ministers and preachers of the Word of God down through the ages have given uh, of these little verses where they've said, if you want to measure the actions of your life, if you want to measure the motives of your heart, if you want to measure your likeness to Christ, then reread the text and put your own name where you read the descriptors of love. Oh, my friends, John is patient and kind. How I long that with ever increasingly spirit filled consistency that flows out of what Jonathan was speaking of in that union and communion with Christ, that it would be true. But I cannot excuse myself because as a child of God, I have the word of God and the power of the Spirit and the desire of God that ever increasingly my life should be and can be measured by the patient and kind acts of love in the way in which I live. John does not envy or boast, takes us back to Cain and Abel and the jealousy and envy of the heart. True worship, true love flows out of true worship and out of true sacrifice. 
Love is not arrogant or rude. How many are the times when we have come across uh, a brother or a sister or we have been that brother or sister. We're insistent upon our own way. We have with arrogance and with rudeness made our position known. And when we think about it in the context of love, and when we think about what John reminds us of in his letters, uh, about, you know, if we don't love our God, then in actual fact, we, if we don't love our brother, we hate our brother, you know, and, and, and you know, we're liars. The love of God is not within us. How these words challenge us at the very depth of our being. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Oh, whenever we read of the fall of a brother or a sister, whenever we see something that we know is not right in their heart, how we ought to go with tears and out of deep love, always only to restore and to set right. And sometimes we can present that we've got all the confidence and all the bluster of mountain moving faith. But there's an absence of love in all that we're saying. How these words expose how much we still have to grow and mature in the life of faith but you know one of the joys of the series that we're in is that it's all about rediscovering the wonder of what God longs to do in us and through us as he shapes and molds us ever increasingly into the likeness of Christ and you and I ever increasingly display because in the end of the little passage, Paul's unpacking for us the, the importance of this, the significance of this. And as he draws attention to kind of childish ways, he's really saying mature in these things, grow in these things, you know, ever increasingly. And it let love, the greatest of these characteristics, be seen in everything that you do, in all that you are. Do you know, I, I want to uh, close this morning with uh, just a, a little story uh, of someone discovering the wonder of this and enabling me to rediscover the wonder. Many, many years ago, I had been uh, working with a, a young couple that came to faith in Christ and they wanted to put everything right and they wanted to get married and I was going through a preparation class with them and they were reading a lot of the scripture. Uh, and one day the girl came in, uh, the two of them came in, but the girl came in and she said, John, John. And I said, what, what? And she said, have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13? And of course, at that point, it would have been all too easy to crush the spirit and show how much we knew. But I remember saying, tell me about it. And she then, for oh a considerable time, just talked about the incredible discovery she had made uh, about First Corinthians thirteen, and uh, about the love of God and how we ought to display the love of God. And then she said the most memorable words, and they made me smile. She said, "John, John, do you not think this is the most beautiful passage to have at a wedding?" And you've got to remember the context. Uh, and I thought of how many people have asked for that passage at a wedding or a funeral. But they've never actually stopped and gazed at the wonder of it. She didn't miss the wonder. And it was a beautiful passage for her wedding. My friends, this morning as we get into this little series, and we know the bedrock, the foundation base of love, and I could preach a series all of its own on this. Let's not lose the wonder 
Let's read again 1 Corinthians 13 slowly this week. Let's read it every day. But let's not just read it. Let's spend some time praying and saying, Lord, in very practical ways, would you help my actions? Would you help my motives to be characterised by love? And the reason I'm saying do it in the word, you know, and do that in the place of prayer, do that in the place of worship, is that true love flows out of true worship. The Lord bless you. Amen.